We are human. No more, no less. As humans, we don't know everything. And perhaps we never will. But being human, it is our duty to discover as much about the world as we can. But we can't do this on our own. It's impossible to keep track of enough information to be able to find all the answers ourselves. So we call on others to help. This is what started the system of peer review. The system which has reliably brought about respectable theories that help us explain the universe. The question you might have is, why can I trust the system? How does peer review make the science right? The system is set about to encourage curiosity and challenge false claims. Say you want to define the contents of milk. You test it and find that it has urea in it. You then publish your findings to share journal science where other independent scientists can view it themselves. They reckon that you might be wrong, so they also test the milk and find that it doesn't contain urea. They then refute your paper and it's now common knowledge that milk does not contain urea. This means that as long as there are multiple teams of researchers working on something, there is almost no chance that a false theory will be declared as fact. Despite this, people still don't trust science. One reason for this is that science is seen as part of the system to make rich businesses even richer. This is because a lot of scientific research requires funding, which often comes from large corporations and can lead to data being manipulated to favour the companies funding the research. The fact peer review exists still nullifies the potential corruption as other companies can fund the same research and have the biases cancel each other out. That's the great thing about science. It's always encouraging people to challenge it and prove it wrong. If someone does prove it wrong, that just makes science as a whole stronger. A theory is like a heavyweight boxer. It might be a good theory and last in the ring for a while, but if a new, better theory comes along that knocks the current one out the ring, that theory becomes champion. Science is always changing and allowing new evidence to be brought in to show that it's wrong. But many so-called sciences don't accept criticism. Pseudosciences manipulate people by sounding plausible, yet lacking any evidence or peer-reviewed testing. The worst pseudoscience in modern society is that of homeopathy. Homeopathy is the treatment of an illness with an incredibly diluted solution of the very substance that caused said illness. To anyone thinking logically, this sounds ridiculous. However, it has been seen to be an effective treatment in many cases. Why? The placebo effect. The placebo effect is a psychological phenomenon that occurs when the mind thinks that a cure for a disease is on its way. The mind then tricks the body into calming any inflammations, even though the drug is ineffective. Because a large proportion of homeopathy patients come into the hospital with only minor ailments, the ineffective drugs trigger the placebo effect, causing any disease to be settled. But what evidence has science shown to name homeopathy a pseudoscience? Many double-blind tests have been done to see if homeopathic medicines have any chemical or biological benefits on humans, or whether it is all just a placebo effect. A double-blind test like this one is done by splitting a random selection of people with the common cold into two different rooms. In one of the rooms, the patients will be given homeopathic pills, and in the other, they'll be given sugar pills that do nothing. The patients are both told that they'll be given homeopathic medicine, they're then observed, and it's seen whether they are cured. This tells us whether homeopathic medicine has any better an effect than sugar pills. It's called a double blind test because the patients are blind to the fact that half the pills are sugar pills. The scientists distributing the pills are also blind to whether the pills are homeopathic or not, meaning only the observing scientists know whether patients are receiving sugar pills or homeopathic pills. So what are the results? 
In 2006, this trial was done with 54 patients who were split 27-27 in the two rooms. Out of all the patients, 8 people claimed they had been cured, 5 of which were from the homeopathic pill group and 3 from the sugar pill group. Out of all 27, only 2 more were cured by the medicine than were by the sugar pills. When this trial was repeated, the results went the other way, with more sugar pill patients feeling cured than homeopathy patients. This shows that sugar pills, which would otherwise have no effect, seem to have as much of an effect on the body as medicines produced in laboratories. This trial is a good demonstration of both the placebo effect and the misunderstanding people have of homeopathic medicines. The website, NHS Choices, states that homeopathy pills have no better an effect than placebo pills. Despite this, the NHS is still spending three to five million pounds per year on providing these ineffective drugs to patients for three to five pounds per packet. This means that every UK citizen is paying tax towards this pointless cause. Homeopathy may be the main pseudoscience chipping away at our taxes, but there are thousands of others which take taxpayers' money, whether they're based around medicine, religion, or other extraordinary ideas. Before paying a lot of money for something, even if it isn't related to homeopathy, make sure you do research into the trialling of the drug to see whether it is effective or not. We've now looked at the scientific system and how some pseudoscientists try to abuse it with placebos. Now we'll take a look at what happens when people don't trust in the scientific method and go to full lengths to disprove its theories and get approval for their own without proper evidence. If I ask you about the planet we live on and how it's shaped, you might tell me it's spherical. You might even go further and tell me it's an ovoid or egg shape. This seems natural to most people. The force of gravity pulls objects of mass together into clumps, which then form spheres. This simple idea explains why the sun and moon are round and why stars appear as points in the sky. But like with homeopathy, is there any evidence to show that this is the case? There's a group of people called the Flat Earth Theorists who don't believe the scientific community when they say the Earth is round. Instead, as their name suggests, they believe the Earth is flat, like a disc. This was a common belief a thousand years ago, before we could easily circumnavigate the ocean and view ourselves from space. Because of this, it is written into many religions as a truth, with people today believing in the firmament a dome in the sky which hoards the sun, moon and stars, as depicted in Genesis 1 of the Bible. This theory may seem ridiculous at first, but then you have a closer look at the evidence and realise maybe they're right. But hang on, you have a closer look and see that the maths doesn't add up and that this theory can be debunked not only by scientists, but by anyone who's ever travelled from one country to another by plane. But what if they're right? Let's take a look at the evidence. A lot of you round earthers have been telling me the earth isn't flat, because then how could sailors circumnavigate the southern ocean? Well, you didn't really think this through, because this is how the map really looks. This explains the day-night cycle a lot more simply than your so-called spinning earth. See how sailors can easily navigate around the southern ocean? Have you wondered why there is a law preventing flight over the Antarctic? The powers of the world don't want you to know you're being lied to. And I see a lot of you asking how we're held down on the world. Telling me that objects wouldn't accelerate at 9.8 meters per second to the ground if the Earth was a disk. You don't realise, however, that a disk is itself accelerating upwards at 9.8 meters per second which makes us feel as if we're being pulled down. Isn't it obvious? The idea that objects with mass affect gravity is just an excuse the corporations have made to put you sheeple in your place. And don't come to me saying that we have photos from space proving the Earth is round. All the photographs you've seen are fake. You want evidence? Take a look at these official NASA photos taken from different years. See how the radius of the Earth in the photos are the same? Now look at the size of North America in all these photos. See how they are never the same for any of the photos. 
NASA, make your mind up when you're faking the photo. Okay, I think I've had enough of that for a while. But his points do beg the question. How can you trust science? You can research online to find the truth, but you can never know if one source is right or another source is right. You could find one saying that the Earth is round and another saying the Earth is flat. It's often best to look at the maths and arithmetic to see which theory is correct. That is the first way in which we will debunk the flat Earth's theory. He states that Earth is a disc, like a plate, with Antarctica on the rim. This neatly explains why we don't fall off the edge when we circumnavigate the world. However, when we look at the maths, we see that it just doesn't add up. The Arctic Circle, shown in the middle, has a circumference of 18,000 kilometers. The map the Flat Earth theorists provide suggests that the Arctic Circle is smaller than any line of latitude south of it, including the Antarctic Circle and the equator. This is just not true, because although the equator is larger than the Arctic Circle, it is easy to prove that the Antarctic Circle is the same size as the Arctic Circle. Logic tells us, along with the equation of the circle, that the Flat Earthists need the Antarctic Circle to be 6.7 times as large as the Arctic Circle. We can measure distances fairly accurately by flying planes at constant velocity around the world and timing the journey. From doing this, pilots and sailors have confirmed that the Arctic Circle is the same size as the Antarctic Circle, debunking one of the Flat Earthers' theories. The gravity of a disk Earth would be nothing like the gravity we experience every day. As you move away from the centre to the edge, or in this case the South Pole, you would slowly be pulled more and more into the centre of mass, in the middle. This is simply not the case in the real world. Now to explain the photos shown by the Flat Earth theorists to prove NASA's lying to the public. You were shown these photos of Earth taken from different times, with America positioned and sized differently. He claims that the difference in each photo shows that NASA faked the images. However, the change can be easily explained with any household camera. The effect that makes America appear bigger is called the dolly zoom effect. The dolly zoom effect occurs when a camera gets closer to an object, but the zoom of the camera decreases. This effectively increases the field of view of the image. Here we see a space probe taking a shot of the Earth from 1 million kilometers away, zoomed in. This would give a shot where America is small. As the camera moves closer to the Earth, it zooms out, increasing the field of view. This slowly increases the apparent size of anything in the centre of the image, or in this case, America. Here I am demonstrating how you can see the dolly zoom effect with any camera that has the ability to zoom. Find a still object and position yourself a few metres in front of it with your camera zoomed in. Then slowly move closer while zooming out to keep the object the same size on the screen. You can easily see it yourself, but here are a few images I made earlier. This shows that these images provided by NASA, where America appears to be sized differently, can be explained with simple optics. The difference in colour and cloud coverage in each photo can be explained by weather patterns and filtering of the image, which changes when different cameras are used at different times. We've covered why the flat earth theorist's criticisms are wrong, but what evidence is there to suggest that the earth is round? There are many things hinting towards a round earth. For one, objects disappear over a horizon rather than endlessly shrinking as you get further away from an object. The way that the Sun and Moon tend to do laps around the Earth also suggests this. If you take time-lapse photos of the Sun every day for a year, you'll see it forms a figure of eight pattern called an analemma. This analemma can be explained by the angle at which the Earth rotates on its axis and the fact that the Earth's orbit of the Sun is slightly elliptical. The closer the Earth is to the Sun, the faster it orbits around, which decreases the length of the day slightly. This forms the left and right movement of the figure of eight. The up and down movement is caused by the angle at which the hemispheres are orientated compared to the sun. In summer, the sun appears higher, and in winter, it appears lower. This explanation works because it doesn't break any laws of physics and agrees with many of the models of the world. Don't trust any of these photos though. They could be fake. 
Instead, try and prove to yourself by taking weekly photos of the sun over a year and comparing the positions. That's the problem with the majority of the Flat Earth Society's arguments. They either consist of trying to disprove accepted theories with contradicting logic, or they try and validate their own theories with incomplete evidence or irrational thinking. That's the problem with the human brain. It's not structured for perfect logical thinking, meaning abstract, unproven ideas can get a foothold in as the truth. The idea that the MMR vaccine causes autism, despite it being unequivocally proven not to. The idea that global warming is a myth because winters have been getting colder, despite the average global temperature being increased by 1.2 degrees over the last century. The idea that GM crops are harmful, even though 98% of corn in the USA in 2010 was GM'd, and all of it was safe. If you didn't trust any of the figures presented to you, that's good. But when seeking the truth, avoid blindly believing ideas and instead look for good research and peer-reviewed work. If someone presents a theory without any evidence, it would never pass the peer review stage. A lot of people believe the earth is flat because they refuse to accept anything presented to them. How can you or they be sure that they're not being lied to about the statistics presented to them? There are thousands of areas of science being researched every day. This produces millions of statistics that may or may not affect your lives. How can any of this be trusted? You can spend time to look into the science and understand it, but you still can't be absolutely sure that the proof is legitimate. You've got to trust that this is how all scientists feel, and that's why they devote their lives to looking into the science themselves to see if it's right. This is what brings about the peer review system. Curiosity and disbelief. If there's a particular area of science you believe to be false or have an interest in, go and gather evidence for your idea and prove it to the world. And then let them go off and prove or disprove it. Don't be dogmatic or religious about ideas. Accept that your ideas might be wrong and allow new ideas to take their place if the evidence is greater. Humans have been thinking less and less dogmatically over the last 500 years which has led to the biggest technological advancement ever. Perhaps in a few decades, non-dogmatic thinking will become the norm and society will progress even faster. Just remember, don't search for simple ideas that are easy to understand without any reason. Search for evidence that backs up a theory. Search for the statistics and arithmetic that supports the theory. Search for peer-reviewed work and ideas that don't contradict one another. Search for the truth. I wanted this film to be a film which explained to the audience what the scientific method was and why it can be abused easily by different people and businesses who want to promote their own product. For example, the homeopathy industry trying to manipulate the placebo effect to sell their drugs. I wanted to do a system where I first wrote the script with research and then edited and filmed what I had written in the script at the same time to kind of allow myself to keep the flow of um, production going and it allowed me to also stabilise my time between editing in the night and filming in the day. The first bit of research I did was watching Jim Al-Khalili's The Beginning and End of the Universe two-part series documentary uh, from this I learned a lot about the kind of production of a documentary rather than how to show my statistics. Uh, I found it useful learning how he brought the beginning of sections 
to life, making them interesting and impactful to the viewer. And I try to incorporate it into my script, which I will be writing next. My script, I first started writing it on a notepad document. Uh, I went forward and back from resources while I did it to find the right facts and actual knowledge, such as in the homeopathy section. And then I went to print it off and corrected it with pen to throw out errors and have a proper read through it. This is me doing that now. As you can see, I'm writing a lot and finding the errors. It took a long time. Uh, and then I would go back and edit it again on the computer and I would repeat this for a few times. I ended up with three drafts, um, first draft, second draft and the editor's draft which I had with me when I was filming and editing the documentary. And next uh, I would go into filming and for filming I hired my sister uh, and we used a Canon camera which was a pretty high quality camera. Uh, we're here on Hambridge Way, uh, and I am currently learning the script for my section for the documentary. And what are you doing, Addy? I'm just trying to um, focus the camera so we can get a good close-up shot of Ben when he walks past and says his lines. Yeah. Can you follow me a little bit? Do it. If like if that. Still talking, make sure you can always see but I won't walk. Don't walk. Okay. okay. And if I stop talking. So we finished filming for the day and right now we're just looking at some footage. Um, so what have we done today? We've done a few scenes including uh, an introduction to homeopathy, pseudosciences and the uh, scientific method. <laughs> I started editing on the day I started filming, putting together bits of behind the scenes and bits of the actual film. Now editing is kind of underrated or it's not commonly known how much work goes into editing a film. It's normally about one hour for every one minute of film. Uh, in this case I think it was about an hour and a half or two hours even for one minute because of the precise cutting that I had to do to match the music and everything up with each other. Uh, so basically here I am later on in the project, editing the final parts, making sure everything fits, making, all the, making sure the music transitions from one section to another. And that's my film done.